I love the springtime because in my opinion, it's the perfect weather to go out hiking, mountain climbing, and cave exploring. Growing up, I always loved being outdoors, though I was admittedly far more adventurous when I was younger. In fact, nowadays I won't even go inside a cave that hasn't been thoroughly explored or is too narrow. And you wouldn't either if you knew what happened to me in Utah back in 2011. It was while I was out visiting my uncle and his friends, which is something I would do a few times a year, and every time we would go out on hikes and explore, which was amazing. This one time though, my uncle was telling me about this cave system that he and his friends found and been spending the past few months slowly exploring deeper and deeper. Once he told me about it, I'm sure he could see the excitement on my face, and he said that he would be visiting the cave at one point while I was at his house. And when that day came, I couldn't have been more excited to get going. We waited for a few of his friends to come to his house, and then we all loaded up into his travel van with our bottles of water and head out to the trail that would ultimately lead us to the cave. The weather was perfect that day. It was about 85 degrees, with clear skies, so you can imagine how much we enjoyed the portion of the hike that was outdoors which led us to the cave. It was a short walk, but one that was full of excitement as we drew closer to the cave that my uncle had been talking up for the past few days. And when I first set my eyes on it, I quickly saw why. The entrance was a simple hole in the base of a small cliff face that was about three feet tall and two feet wide. That meant in order to get inside the cave, we would have to go onto our hands and knees and make our way through a small tunnel that would lead us to the first chamber. The tunnel was only about 10 feet long, and once we got inside, the cave opened up quite a bit. It wasn't quite tall enough to stand up, but it was big enough to fit comfortably with a few people in the first chamber and sit along the walls. I couldn't wait to go in deeper to see what it was really like, and for the most part, it was great. As the cave continued to open, we were able to stand up more and more as we squeezed our way through the narrow passways between the chambers. And after what it seemed like an hour of making our way deeper into the dark but beautiful cave, we had finally reached a point where my uncle said was the farthest they had made it in since before this they were taking their time carefully mapping out the cave. We all looked around a bit to figure out the next move and the only viable path seemed to be a small crawl space that would require us to lay flat on our stomachs and wiggle our way through. The space was about eight inches wide from the floor to the top of the passage, and at first, my uncle was supposed to go before all of us. However, after some light begging, I had to convince them to let me be the first person into the next chamber. My uncle reluctantly agreed to let me go in because he didn't know exactly where it would lead, but he knew I wouldn't take no for an answer and let me be the first through. This is where it all went wrong. I began to wiggle in through the small passage, but it wasn't long before I realized that there was nowhere to go, and before I freaked out too much about the possibility of being stuck, I began to wiggle myself backward. I'm not sure what exactly happened, but my feet must have kicked up too much and as they brushed along the ceiling of the tunnel, I heard the terrible sound of rocks falling. I could see the dust kicking up around me through my headlamp, and as I tried to move further backward, I felt my feet hit what felt like a wall. I had caved myself into a small tunnel and was now stuck in a space so small that I couldn't move off of my stomach. I called for help and I could luckily hear my uncle yelling back to me as he tried to shove and push the loose rocks away. I began to panic, though I did my best to control my breathing. The last thing I wanted was to pass out. I was stuck in that position for about three hours before my headlamp died, and I was in total darkness. The only thing keeping me calm was my uncle who would periodically yell for me and tell me about the progress they were making. I was trapped in that passage for about six hours before they had finally been able to move the rocks. They had to form a system to move them out of the way and not plug up their only exit as they did it. 
Once I was free, we all quickly and safely made it out of the cave. My uncle and I agreed on two things that day. One was to not tell my parents about that. Neither of us wanted to feel their wrath. The other was that we would never do anything that stupid again. I had been getting ready to move out of my house in Kentucky and head to my new home in Philadelphia. And before officially leaving, I wanted to get the place professionally cleaned. I hired a cleaning company to come out and clean the house while I was away for the weekend at my cousin's wedding. And by the time I came back, the place was spotless. I couldn't have been happier. My only issue was that for some reason there was now a weird noise coming from the house. Every now and then, it would sound like a small clicking noise was coming from the wall. So in my head, I assumed that it was something wrong with the electricity in the house, and I couldn't leave it like that. So I ended up having to get a hold of an electrician to come out and look at the house. The electric company said that they could have someone over in two days, which was fine with me. And over the next two days, I had just put up with the clicking noise, which seemed to go on and off throughout the day, but be rather quiet at night, which was another thing that I thought was odd. The two days finally passed, and the electric company finally sent someone to check the clicking noise, and right away, the guy was confused. He had never heard that before. He said he was likely going to have to make a cut in the wall to expose the wire and see if something was wrong with it. I didn't like that idea, but there wasn't really any other option. But when he finally cut through the wall, I was super happy that I let him. What I thought was an electrical issue was far more terrifying. Inside the wall, we found one of the cleaners who I had hired to clean up my house, and he had somehow been trapped there for nearly four days. We immediately called emergency services, along with the police who assessed the situation. After getting him out of the wall, it was determined that he must have fallen through the floor in the attic when he was straightening up, and when that dropped him into a small crawl space between the walls, he was trapped. He normally would have been able to scream for help, but when he fell through the attic floor, a broken piece of wood ended up piercing itself upward through his jaw and into his mouth. Had it gone even half an inch further, he would have likely died. Instead, he was left trapped between the drywall and the foundation with only enough room to slightly move one hand, which he used to knock on the wall. On the other side of the wall, however, that knocking simply sounded like a clicking sound. When the cleaning company was asked why he wasn't reported as missing when he didn't come out of the attic that day, they all said this particular worker had been talking about quitting for weeks, and they honestly just assumed he had walked off the job site without saying anything. The worker spent the next week in the hospital and had to get a small surgery on his lower jaw. When he was finally able to talk, he described what it was like being trapped standing in a wall with no way to call for help. He said that it felt like he had been somehow buried alive in a standing coffin. He was almost positive that he was going to die and just thankful that we heard him knocking even though we mistook it as an electrical malfunction. One of the easiest jobs I ever had was at the Quick Trip gas station in my town. That being said, it was also where I had the single worst experience of my life. And it's something that still bothers me to this day. It happened in the middle of August back in 2005. I was working the overnight shift at the gas station by myself. Now typically, I enjoyed the night shift. It was usually pretty slow and I would only have to deal with a few customers. And as long as it wasn't a weekend, it was normally just people in a rush to get their gas and get home. The weekends could be a bit bothersome sometimes, when intoxicated people would come in and act like fools. But other than that, I didn't really mind the night shift. That night started off pretty normal. It was a Wednesday night, so it was one of the slower ones. And it must have been about 1.30 in the morning, when a beat up Mustang pulled up to one of the pumps and two guys hopped out and began walking toward the store. I put down the book I was reading and got ready to serve them. And as I expected, when they came in, 
One of them asked me to put $20 in the pump that he'd just parked at. Meanwhile, the other man got into the cooler and grabbed two sodas. I ring the two up and they left the store. I thought that was the end of it. But oddly enough, before I could get back to reading my book, I began to hear yelling coming from outside. I looked up and saw the two men were now grabbing one another and they appeared to be fighting. I was taken back by this because I thought they were friends. But when I saw they had gotten physical with each other, I ran out of the store and up to the two men yelling at them to stop before I called the police, which caught their attention for sure. Only, it turned out they were less afraid of my threat and more interested in me. Their fight must have just been a ploy to pull me out of the store because once I was close enough, they both turned to me and began attacking. It wasn't long before I was on the ground, and after a few boots to my head, everything went black. I'm not sure how long I was unconscious, but when I came to, I quickly realized that I had been locked in some sort of small container. There was just enough room for me to lay flat on my back and move my arms around a bit, but I could hardly lift my head before it would hit the ceiling of whatever I had been trapped in. Panic quickly began to set in, and I did everything that I could to scream as loudly as I could. But I couldn't hear any sort of response. I tried to bang on the lid and flailed my feet around in hopes of possibly kicking the container open, but there was absolutely no budge. Nothing I did seemed to matter, and the more I thought about my situation, the more I freaked out. I tried to roll onto my side, but there wasn't enough room to make any such movement. Claustrophobia began to set in, which was odd because I had never been afraid of tight spaces before. Then again, I had never been trapped before either. I continued to flail about and scream at the top of my lungs, but that only caused me to panic more, which eventually led me to hyperventilating and ultimately passing out once again. Surprisingly enough, I woke up once more and I hoped with all of my might that I had been just having a bad dream. But sadly, this was not the case. I was still trapped in whatever enclosure my attackers had placed me in. I didn't know what to do anymore. I felt entirely defeated at that point, and it was almost as if I knew that I wasn't going to make it out. Silence fell over my tomb, and I lay in the darkness just thinking back on my life. And I'm not sure how much time had passed before I heard it, but eventually, I heard the sound of people talking coming from above me. My eyes widened with hope, and I began to scream once again. I could hear the people and they sounded as if they were getting louder and louder. And soon enough, I heard the sound of scratching on top of the container. And when the lid finally popped open, I saw what I had been trapped in. After being knocked unconscious, I had been put into a large wooden box and then buried alive. They were trying to kill me. Standing above me were three uniformed police officers who were shocked that I was still alive. They said, that I had been buried for nearly 12 hours. And the only reason they found me was that one of the guys that attacked me decided to brag about it to a friend at one of the local bars shortly after attacking me. Apparently, his friend had a conscience, and though he thought the guy was full of it, he still reported it to the police. As soon as the police approached the man who attacked me and began to question him about it, they said that he folded very fast. He told them about his partner, and then even told them where they had buried me. It turns out, I wasn't the first either. According to the officer, they were looking for four more burial sites much like mine. Only, there was no hope that anyone else would have survived, as they had been missing for more than a year, with the oldest case dating back nearly a decade. I had almost become a victim of two serial killers. And to this day, I can't help but think about how lucky I am to have survived. <laughs>